Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gartner Research and Advisory VP Analyst and Conference Chair, Suzanne Adnams. Welcome to our closing Industry Day keynote. Peter Hinson, founder of Networks, is one of the most sought-after thought leaders on radical innovation, leadership, and the impact of all things digital on society and business. A serial entrepreneur, an advisor, keynote speaker, and author, Peter lectures at various business schools such as London Business School and MIT in Boston. Peter's latest book, The Day After Tomorrow, helps organizations become fluid, innovative, and thrive. We're excited to have him here today. Please welcome to the Gartner stage, Mr. Peter Hinson. Thank you. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening with you and to close off this first day and to talk about something that is very close to my heart, which is the day after tomorrow. But I want to start with this, and this is where I see how many old people are in the audience, um, because this is the movie that probably had the biggest impact on me as a kid. This is Blade Runner, uh, came out in 1982 when I was 13 years old. And this is probably the reason why I got into technology, why I got into IT, why I really embraced digital, because I really wanted to live in this world. The interesting thing about Blade Runner is it came out in 1982, but actually was set in 2019. So my entire life, I have been looking forward to this year. And imagine my enormous disappointment when none of this has actually been you know, true. We, we're not hunting down replicants. Um, you know, buildings don't look like this. My entire life has been a sham, if you put it in that perspective. But we do live in a world of radical change, and many of us will probably see that more profoundly at home than maybe at work. I have two children, 20 and 16. And in our house, it's very simple. The quality of me as a father is completely correlated to the quality of the Wi-Fi signal in our house. <laughs> Wi-Fi is good, and I'm an OK dad. And even the tiniest hiccup, which interrupts a millisecond of interruption in their Netflix or YouTube stream, and they question the fact whether I actually got a computer science degree in the first place. That is the situation today where we're seeing that digitalization has become absolutely the new normal. And we talk about disruption like it's the most normal thing. But are we prepared for a world where this might be just the warm-up act? I mean, we've seen in the last couple of years that we're at a crossroads where technology and economy are colliding, and it's beginning to impact many different sectors. One of them is retail. I think this is the most wonderful crossroads at this moment, where we see how technology is reshaping an entire market, an entire industry. But this is just the beginning. It's not just technology and economy. We're at a crossroads where technology and politics are colliding, for example. What you see here is Peter Thiel, um, you know, one of the co-founders of PayPal, and today one of the most influential people in Silicon Valley. And I think Peter Thiel was the only person in Silicon Valley who believed that Donald Trump would win. I think Thiel was the only Republican in Silicon Valley. <laughs> but Thiel is not just the co-founder of PayPal, he's also the founder of Palantir, which is one of the most amazing and scary AI companies in the world. And maybe because he had access to that data, and now we know that they probably colluded with Cambridge Analytica, Thiel not only knew that Trump would win, maybe he actually helped Trump get elected. Anyway, this is my favorite moment. When Trump got elected, he called Peter Thiel and said, gather me the captains of industry on Silicon Valley. And if you look at the way that the CEO of Apple, Mr. Tim Apple, stares into that lens, you can see that this was an awkward meeting. <laughs> it's not just technology and politics, technology and geopolitics were rapidly colliding into a new Cold War. And it is fascinating how this has played out. And this is, in my opinion, just the beginning. My favorite thing last year that happened was these two babies that were born at the end of 2018 in China. They were CRISPR-Cas9 modified 
to actually be born and be HIV resistant. These babies were genetically modified to never have AIDS. Honestly, we are now beginning to see that when we talk about disruption, this goes way beyond digital, and the question is, will we cope? And many people said, oh my God, it's going so fast. Will we be able to cope? And I think we have nothing to worry about because humans are very good at change. Only 300 years ago, we had the social revolution, which the French still call the French Revolution, but you know, they're French. But this basically reshaped societies as we have them today. The number one outcome of the social revolution was the state, the way we organize our countries. Then 150 years ago, we had the Industrial Revolution, and this had a major impact on employment. What you see here is the number of jobs in agriculture in the beginning and at the end of the Industrial Revolution. In many countries, it went from more than 70% to less than 10% in 100 years. But if you look at the real outcome of the Industrial Revolution, it was basically the firm. The way we organize organizations and companies is based on that premise. And now, I think we're at the beginning, still the very early stages of something fundamentally new. This is one of my favorite images. What you see here is President Clinton connecting a school to the information superhighway in 1996, assisted by his faithful assistant and sidekick, Al Gore. This is only 20 years old. And if you see that social gave us the state and industrial gave us the firm, we're beginning to see that the early signs of this really radical new revolution might be empowerment. We see that consumers are empowered like never before. Citizens are empowered. Employees are empowered. But it's still early game, and we have to seize the opportunity. But the big question is, are we making progress? Are you making progress as an individual, as a team, as a company, as an organization? And in order to do that, we need a better radar screen. We need to understand the things that are rapidly approaching us. And it's true, I grew up with the idea that Blade Runner will be the future, and, and we have no idea what the long-term future is. One of the fascinating things is when I looked at the buildings in Blade Runner, I couldn't understand why they looked so familiar. And last year, I took my family to Mexico for the first time, and I thought, aha, I have seen this before. And what is fascinating is we have no idea what these buildings were used for 3,000 years ago. We have no idea what the long-term future is, but it's even worse than that. We have no idea what happened yesterday, we have no idea what happened last night, and we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. We are in a world that's moving faster than ever before, and our visibility is actually getting shorter. So if we want to innovate, and this is no longer a luxury, but an absolute necessity, our radar screen to pick up things is more important than ever before. And then the question is, how do you respond? This is one of my favorite videos. This is a documentary from 1911, where a Swedish documentary maker went to New York and recorded this amazing video. And you've all been there. This is the Flatiron Building. But New York is filled with horses and carriages until the first automobile arrives onto the scene in 1911. And if you were there, I have no idea what your reaction would be. Would you be excited or enthused or scared or angry? This man was angry. This man, Ed Klein, sold horses in New York. And he hated the hype around the automobile. He thought it was just a bunch of baloney. And he was so angry that he put out this ad in the New York Times to convince people not to fall into the hype of the automobile, but just to keep on buying horses. Now, of course, 100 years later, there's only one conclusion. Ed was an idiot. <laughs> but if you were there in 1911 and you owned a stable, would you have seen the potential of the automobile and turned your stable into a garage? Or would you have said, nah, I'm going to milk this horse business for as long as I can? And this is exactly where we are. It's not about technology, it's about change. The willingness to change and the capacity to change. And about seizing opportunities. Now, I'm a technologist, I'm an engineer, I'm a bit of a Musk fan, I have to admit. When the Falcon Heavy was launched for the first time last year, I got goosebumps. And, and the launch was spectacular, but when it came down, it was even more spectacular. This is, for me, already the image of 2018. And it was fascinating, but the guy is absolutely nuts. I mean, he put a, a red Tesla Roadster in a one billion year orbit around the sun. Do you know what that means? I mean, it has a bright don't panic sticker on the dashboard, but it means that in one billion years from now, if there are still humans on the planet, somebody's going to look up and say, what the hell is that? It's fascinating. But ask you this question, what if Elon would be one of your employees? How many yes, but questions would you throw at the guy? 
Last week, he launched the first 60 of the 11,943 Starlink satellites, which were deployed and started to circle the Earth, which is starting to build a global network of telecommunications that could potentially completely replace our conventional communications. The guy is nuts, but he's seizing the opportunities. How many people in your organization do you have that are willing to push the envelope and see what comes out in a world where now technology has become normal. I've been using this S-curve for a long time, and we've all seen the S-curve in the last couple of years where technology was first special and digital was new, and now digital is actually normal. And it's not always good. This is my favorite sad slide. What you see here is two people in bed, faces illuminated by the shining of their smartphones. And you know what the irony is? They're talking to each other. I mean, they're communicating about who's going to pick up the kids from school the next day. This is my favorite image from the last presidential election in the US. We are connected more than ever before, and we're not just in a network. We start to trust technology with an almost blind faith in record time. And we've seen that transition. And some of you remember the old normal. This is an ad from 1980 advertising a 10 megabyte hard disk for $3,495. And I wrote a book a few years ago called Digital is the New Normal. And I update this every year. These are my new normals of 2019. Some of these are more consumer uh, oriented. I mean, social, multi-channel, big data, and mobile. Some of them are more enterprise, cloud, agile, platform, and APIs. But what you see is that these have become the new normal because every startup that starts today takes this as the baseline. This is their ground zero. This is where they start. And if you're not there as an organization, you're actually falling behind. So instead of the new normal, I should start talking about the never normal because we are seeing a constant acceleration. And disruption isn't technology. Disruption is almost like a virus that is changing almost every single sector that is out there. And for the last couple of years, we've talked a lot about these magical unicorns, these new technology giants that come out of nowhere and become really, really big. And maybe you, like me, I'm getting a little tired of the stories about the unicorns. And I've become obsessed recently with the phoenix, because I think that's a much more interesting mythical animal, a creature that can reinvent itself under great stress and even come out stronger in the end. And many of you in this room will never be a unicorn, but some of you could be a phoenix. And in many sectors, we're seeing that transition. And I take retail as an example. This is, you know, if you have kids, you will understand this. The Atlantic talks about the touchscreen generation. This is my favorite Santa Claus ad for Santa Claus letter of a young girl who writes, Dear Santa, how are you? I'm good. Here is what I want for Christmas. And then the Amazon URL of what this child wants to have under the Christmas tree. And this is no longer an absurdity. This is a reality now. And we all know the unicorn. I mean, this is the company that is transforming itself. When it launched Amazon Go two years ago, it was seen as, as, as a why. Why does Amazon think about the physical store of the future when it's an online retailer? When they bought Whole Foods for $13.4 billion, we got an idea. The moment they bought Whole Foods for $13.4 billion, their stock went up by $15 billion. It is fascinating to see that this is the company that is pushing the envelope on innovation. They're getting into fresh and into groceries, into logistics. But last year, I was invited to the other side. I was invited to do a keynote like this for the headquarters of Walmart, and, and they're in, in Bentonville, Arkansas. And this has redefined my idea of the middle of nowhere. I, I thought Canada was remote, but no, Bentonville.